we need to block DML between 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. This is trickier than it sounds. Time of day controls. Here's the question that came in. We need to block DML between 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. This is the ultimate in business hours control. People are allowed to update the data during the day, but they're not allowed to touch it during the night. How do we control this? Now, the big question I have, of course, is why? I, I, it seems such a strange requirement to me to have. Why would stop people being able to update data for a particular time of day? I, you know, I don't want to push back and say that seems a very odd requirement, but it seems a strange thing. The, the object of a database is to, to make the data available to customers, not to restrict it from it, but let us proceed. Let's look at some of the options and we'll see that this is actually a little bit trickier than it might sound. I'm going to create a table called T. It's just a copy of scott.emp. This is my probably my first you know, thing that came into my mind. If I'm going to stop any DML, I'll just do it with a trigger. I've got a trigger called T blocker before insert, before update, before delete, and whatever you do, just raise application error and say no. That seems a fairly obvious and trivial solution. But funny enough, the reason I say this is a bit trickier is you then have to go and make sure this actually works. You have to test this. You might think, well, that's easy. Insert, update, delete. No worries, let's try that. Delete, not allowed to do it. Fine, I can tick off that box. Try an update, not allowed to do it. Fine, I can tick off that test. I can try an insert, I'm good. But there's more to DML than just that. What about merge? Thankfully, merge will still fire insert, update, or delete triggers. So I'm covered off there. But what about parallel DML? Because that takes table level locks. Does it bypass the trigger? No, it doesn't, thankfully. So we've covered off that test as well. What about direct mode insert? Thankfully, direct mode insert is converted to a conventional insert if triggers exist, and therefore, we also fire the trigger. So far, so good. Everything's covered off there. We haven't been able to circumvent this issue. Let's turn off parallel DML. What about if it's a foreign key? What if my table T is actually a child table of a parent and that table has a delete cascade? Will the trigger catch that? We have to test that as well. So here's table T1 as a parent of T. I'll add a primary key on the job table and now add a constraint such that we have a list of distinct jobs as a parent and my table T, which is a copy of scott.emp, has individual jobs which now relate back to the parent on delete cascade. Here's my list of distinct jobs. What if I delete one of these jobs? Will the delete cascade be blocked by the trigger? Yes, it will. So the trigger is looking good so far. I just wanted to put these because it reinforces there are so many things you need to test just to make sure what seems like an obvious solution is indeed a solution. Let's now try SQL Loader. Now I'm using SQL Loader Express Mode here. If you've never seen that, um, just a quick segue. SQL Loader Express Mode lets you simply run SQL Loader with a CSV or various common format files with no control file. It just looks at the table, finds the column definitions, looks at the flat file, tries to map them together, and comes up with a SQL Loader control file on the fly. So it's a nice way of loading the most common formats. So what's my password? Did I get that right? Now that doesn't look good, does it? If I do SQL loader direct mode, look what happens. It happily loaded 14 rows. If I look at the rows that were in that flat file, you can see I took all the typical Scott that emp rows and added the leading digit eight to the employee number. Normally all the employee rows have a leading digit of seven. So did they actually make it into the table? Yes, they did. So even though I had a trigger on there, SQL loader direct mode, bypasses that trigger. Most of the time, I'd argue a trigger is probably going to be a fine solution. But if you're doing SQL loader, then you have this issue. What, what if, and what would be the most common time you would run large SQL loader jobs? Probably during the evening, overnight. Therefore, you would bypass this restriction. Just to reinforce, there are so many avenues you need to check and test if you choose seems to be simple solutions to simple problems. So let's drop the trigger. What are some other options we could explore? I could do alter table T read only. This came in, I think, in Oracle 11. You can set a table to being read only. It might be Oracle 12, but it's been around for a sufficient time. Once again, we do our test. Can we delete? Can we insert, update, merge, etc.? That's all fine. 
What about our SQL loader? Let's give that a go again. And that's cool, right? We can't even do a direct load insert because the read-only overrides that. So SQL loader, we're now protected from as well. Let's make it read-write again. Here is the issue when you start looking at things like a DDL style solution. What happens if I have an open transaction when 7 p.m. comes around and I want to stop this DML from occurring? I can simulate that in a single session using an autonomous transaction. So what I've got here is I'm going to try set my table to read only in a separate session, a autonomous transaction. And the time I try to run it, I've got an uncommitted transaction. You know, my application is running. So someone has a DML that is not yet committed. What happens at 7 p.m. if I try to alter table read only because that looks better than the trigger? Then I get resource busy. Once again, even alter table read only has its own set of special conditions, which are now more complicated because if I have active DML at the boundary time, 7 p.m., I'm going to have a drama. Could I work around this? Well, what I could do is do something like set the DDL lock timeout to a particular amount of seconds. So now I'm going to wait for those DMLs to commit, hopefully within five seconds, and then try again. Now, in this case, because I'm doing it with an autonomous transaction, it'll wait five seconds, but I'm still going to get the error because I haven't committed that delete statement. And we get the same problem. Could you maybe combine this with other things? Yes, you could. I'm not going to run this because it would take too long to implement the plan and do a test, but you could create up a resource manager plan, which I've got an example here called stop blockers, you can see here. And what that'll do is if someone is a blocking session and they block someone for more than 10 seconds, that session would be terminated. So I could use this in conjunction with DDL lock timeout, in conjunction with alter table read only, to do something like at 7 p.m., set DDL lock timeout to say 60 seconds, set my resource manager plan to say 40 seconds. After 40 seconds, if that delete statement is blocking someone, it's going to get canceled, and then my alter table read only is most likely to succeed. What was a simple <laughs> problem is now getting a relatively amount of complexity around the issue. So as I said, this is trickier than it sounds. And I would probably say for most people, the trigger is going to be a adequate solution, but you do need to be wary of SQL loader direct mode because it will simply bypass it. Obviously, things where we have things like, you know, the ability to take triggers and disable them, you need to now have much more finely tuned security to make sure that those facilities aren't available. If someone's running a peel SQL piece of code as the same owner as the table, then they would be able to add an execute immediate alter trigger enable or disable. So you need to be careful of that. Um, one solution I didn't talk about here, which I've seen floating around, is this thing called table level locking. With the Oracle database, you can do alter table disable table lock or alter table T disable lock. What that says is you can still do row level locking, so you can still do insert, update, delete, but you cannot do DDL. You cannot add columns, drop columns, etc. Why would this be useful here? You could put your trigger in place and then do alter table disable lock which means you would not be able to do any SQL loaded direct load. In that way, the trigger now works in all possible scenarios. That sounds like a really nice facility, but if you do alter table T disable lock, that's instantaneous. To re-enable locking, let's say you want to add a column. Let's say you want to actually do a direct load. Alter table T enable locking requires all active transactions in your pluggable database to be completed not just transactions on that table, any transaction. You cannot have an active transaction of any sort and change the locking status of a particular table. So that's a big deal because you may get stuck in a situation where you've turned off table locking and you can't turn it back on again. And therefore you can't do the DDL you want it to do. So that's why I didn't talk about that solution because I think the risks there are too large. Okay.